pain compliance techniques are common in multiple forms of martial arts, usually geared towards self-defense. So they're present in Krav Maga, in Aikido, a little bit in Kajukembo. Essentially, what a pain compliance technique is, is that I'm gonna hurt you so badly that you're gonna wanna stop fighting me. My thesis is that that's a complete waste of time. So at its simplest form, a pain compliance technique is, can I see your hand please? I'm gonna take Antonio's hand here and crank his wrist in a direction it doesn't wanna go. Now, this hurts and if I go hard enough with it, it might break it. But what this doesn't do is stop him from doing anything to hurt me. So if he wasn't already wanting to fight me, I'm actually escalating it and doing nothing to protect myself. Now, I think the most egregious example of this is the straight standing arm bar. Because what everyone in the world, actually let's do it from a punch. What everyone in the world does is that he's gonna throw a straight punch at me, I'm gonna come here, block, step out of the way, and here, drop to a standing arm bar. At this point, a lot of times they'll start sawing the arm and walk him over into the ground or out the door, whatever. They'll say it's a bouncer's technique. And yes, if you're fighting someone who doesn't necessarily know what they're doing or doesn't have any desire to hurt you, it might actually work. But let me show you how easy it is for Antonio to get out of this position. Let me see that arm again, please. Go ahead, boom, here, bang. Now, do literally anything, even if it hurts, to make me stop doing this. Yeah, all he has to do is bend his arm. Now, I'm gonna put some pressure on your arm and I want you to stop me from doing this, okay? I'm gonna put some pressure and pull on your arm. It's that much work for him to get out of this position. Now, the reason these techniques are so prevalent in martial arts is because in martial arts training, they work very effectively. Um, you know what, go ahead and put me in the standing arm bar. Go ahead, okay. put it right there, boom. Now, right now, when I've got no adrenaline and no desire to do anything but let you work, this is pretty painful. Yeah. I'm just letting you do it. Now, the only thing I'm gonna do from here is flex. Suddenly, that hurts a lot less. Now, you're starting to roll it, Yeah. okay? In training, I'm just gonna let him do this. But in reality, as he starts to hurt that, what am I gonna do? Start moving, right? Yeah. In a training room, in a training scenario, I want you to succeed, so I'll let you do it. But that can develop some really bad habits. Now, that's not necessarily the case for, let me see like a one-two. If Antonio throws a one-two, that is universally always gonna work, whether I want him to or not. If he throws a one-two at me, go ahead, bang, boom, right? That still works. Even if I cover up and he hands on my forearm, instead of my face, that's still a straight one-two. He doesn't have to modify anything about what he's doing to hit me. But, if we're talking about joint locks, groin kicks, eye pokes, whatever, those have to modify if I don't want you to do them, correct? Yes. So, these techniques are valuable, but not more valuable than gross motor movements. The reason that people think this works is because technically what I'm doing here and here is not holding him in position, but actually breaking the position. Meaning, if I have the arm here, I'm breaking through. I'm breaking him at the elbow, breaking him at the wrist. Problem with that is, I can't really train that. I can do that to him exactly twice before I have to find a new training partner. And if I'm relying on breaking someone's arm in training, but I'm not actually able to practice it, then I'm not actually gonna be able to do it in real time. But I can see the logic here. The idea being, if this is a position that can break his arm, and we're both aware of that, he'll stop what he's doing so that I don't break his arm. But here's the thing. If Antonio's high on a fistful of PCP, he doesn't care that I broke his arm. I can come here and shatter it, and he will still turn to fight me and he will deal with the consequences of that later on. Which is great, because when he wakes up in the next morning, he'll have an arm dangling like this, but in the moment, he'll still be fighting me. So relying on pain compliance techniques only means that I'm hoping in the future, there will be consequences for what he's doing right now. Instead of fighting for pain right now, I wanna actually secure control. Instead of coming here and depending on this pain to be enough to make him stop, I actually wanna switch, I prefer to switch, to an arm drag position, where now, go ahead and try and fight out of this. He starts taking his arm away, he bends his arm, Go ahead. What he's doing is actually keeping me glued to him. No matter what he does, I still have control of him. And once I start moving, you feel that pressure on your arm again? Yeah. There's still pressure on his arm, but there's not as much risk of him getting away from it. And if I really do want to, I can come here, snap, and then go for the arm drag. Now I know there's some jackass in my comment section saying, well, we're not really training a lock here, or a lock here, or a lock here. We are in fact training for a break. But the thing is, not every situation in the world requires a break. Antonio and I get along relatively well. But let's say he decides to step up to me. Go ahead and give me a push. I don't like that. Do it again. Boom, right there. Am I gonna break your arm at this point? Would that be a justified reaction in this situation? I'd hope not. It's not. There are guys who train and think every single time someone lays a hand on them, it's time to push them away, draw, fire, and kill. 
That's just not how 90% of altercations go. Instead, what I'd much rather do, go ahead and push me. Stop. Don't do that. And then slap him. Because most altercations are going to end that quickly. Not everything is a life or death situation, and most things aren't a broken joint situation. Now, there's definitely a time to do that, but there's a time for everything. And I would say, most of the time, being able to walk someone out safely is much better than trying to say, oh, I would just break your elbow, I would just break your knee. It doesn't really work, or at least that's not the smart thing to do most of the time. Now, that actually leads me to a second form of pain compliance that I think is a lot more common. That being eye pokes and groin kicks. Because unless I'm training in such a way that I'm gonna come up to Antonio and gouge his eyes out, really what I'm doing is hoping that poking him in the eyes hurts so bad that he wants to stop fighting me, or kicking him in the groin disables him so he falls to the ground and stops fighting me. Now, you're a man. Presumably, you've had balls your entire life. What is the first thing you do if you see anything coming close to your groin? Nope. You immediately cover up. That's just our natural instinct. Now, I can't say if that is nature or nurture, because I think we've all been hitting the groin accidentally, and we've learned to just cover up. So, let's play a little game, okay? Stay right there. I don't know if I like this game. Back up a little bit. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you a larger target than my groin. You're gonna aim right here at the elephant on my stomach. Okay. Not up here, not down here, right there, the lower half. I want you to just touch it with your foot. Okay, go ahead and get a little practice shot in there. Okay. Boom, right there, okay, do it again. Bang, okay, now for the next 10 seconds, I want you to try and touch it, go for it. Boom, again, go ahead, go. And three, two, and one. How hard was that? Pretty hard. That's pretty hard. And that's a much bigger target than the groin, and it should be much easier for you to land, and yet it still wasn't. Why was it harder for you to land it? I mean, you knew it was coming. But I also, knew it was coming. Hands. Hands, and? You moved. I'm moving. A lot of times when we train these groin strikes, and these eye pokes, these sensitive areas, our opponent's just standing there while we wail away on them. And it looks great in training, but again, realistically, I'm gonna be moving. And if I can't reliably land a kick on the stomach or a hook to the head, how am I gonna aim for an even smaller target like the eyes or the pills right there? Again, I'm not saying it's not valuable to know how to do these things, but relying on them to be the things that work in a fight, hmm, it's a little risky. Now, that's not to say you can't have them in your arsenal, because yes, kicking someone in the groin can be devastating, but so can a hook to the liver. So can a smack to the temple. It's another tool in the arsenal, but it's not the tool in the arsenal. Tools, tools go in toolboxes, weapons go in arsenals. Yes. But the point is, whether we're talking about joint locks that are really breaks, or strikes that are really secret kung fu pressure points, it doesn't matter. If you're relying on them to be the thing that saves you in a life or death situation, or a minor altercation, or even just a fight, I don't think you actually know how to fight. Anyway, that was just my brief dialogue on pain compliance and why it isn't something you should rely on in an actual fight or self-defense situation. Antonio, I wanna thank you for joining me. I hope you guys never ever train those techniques again unless you do them right. As always, this has been Rob in Combat Self-Defense as well as Antonio for the first time ever. I wanna thank you guys for all the hard work. Thank you for the hard work yet to be done and I'll see you next time.